there is a certain conception of rationality uh, which is very widespread in our intellectual culture. It comes out, uh, if you've ever had a course in economics, or if you've ever read a book or an article on decision theory, it comes out more or less explicitly. When I took economics as an undergraduate a long time ago, <coughs> it, was, it wasn't so much uh, preached as it was taken for granted. Uh, occasionally they might mention puzzles about it, but it was assumed that economic agents were rational. And indeed, on this conception, economics as a discipline presupposed the rationality of the economic agent. And what is rationality so conceived? Well, I made a list of some of the features, and I naturally, uh, I guess being a philosopher, my uh, temptation was to list the features I disagreed with, but here are the ones that seem to me absolutely common. And by the way, this is widespread in philosophy. I think most philosophers have this conception of rationality as well. Uh, the first is actions are caused by beliefs and desires. Our old friends Bell and Des, and you might add actions where rational are caused by beliefs and desires. And then it turns out that rationality, if you assume that, then rationality can be rather easily designed. The rational act is the act which maximizes the probability of satisfying your desires given your beliefs. So you have a set of beliefs about uh, uh, what uh, kind of car would be best for you, and you want a certain kind of car, and you have a certain set of uh, resources of how much money you can spend, and then you try to maximize the probability that your desires will be satisfied on, given the assumption of your beliefs. Now, if you say that just like that, it sounds pretty good to me. I mean, I, that's a lot of the time what we do. And what advertisers try to do is influence your desires and uh, beliefs. Uh, they try to make such and such a model of car seem more sexy uh, by showing uh, the, the, the car is always populated by beautiful women or whatever in the ads. And then they have stories about how uh, uh, the car is cheaper, you pay less for it. Etc. Okay, the actions were rational are caused by beliefs and desires. Now, a second principle on this conception of rationality is that if you're going to be rational, you have to follow the rules of rationality. And the rules will tell you, the rules of Bayesian decision theory will tell you how to calculate your chances of satisfying your desires given your beliefs. There are a set of rules that will enable you uh, to reason rationally and make decisions rationally. Now, a third a conception, a third piece of this conception is that, in fact, rationality is a separate cognitive capacity. Uh, indeed, we have no less, low, less an authority than Aristotle we have no less an authority than Aristotle to say it is the distinctive cognitive capacity of our species. We're defined as rational animals. We're defined as animals capable of reasoning, and no other animal can reason in the way that we do. There is a problem, however, with this, and that is weakness of will is a problem. And indeed, you remember, famously, the Greeks said that people always do what they believe to be best. Hence, when somebody does something that's not best, it can really only be due to ignorance. It must have been due to some kind of mistake or lack of knowledge or lack of ignorance. And the argument goes, look, if you're doing something 
voluntarily, intentionally. You're not forced to do it. Nobody's putting a gun at your head. You're doing as we say of your own free will. Then it must be because you think that's the best thing to do. But then if that's right, then it would be impossible uh, for anybody to do something that ran counter to what they thought was the best thing to do. So in cases of apparent weakness of will, and the Greek word has uh, become common here in the literature, in the cases of apparent akrasia, it can only be because there was something wrong with the beliefs and the desires. As Davidson says in his article on weakness of will, he says, well, this is the case where you didn't have an unconditional desire where you acted out of weakness of will. If you had an honest to John, all out, unconditional desire, then you would act on that desire. Now, I have to gasp in disbelief when I read this because I have acrasia several times a day. Uh, and it's not a big deal. I think, you know, I really ought to think about what I'm going to say in my Philosophy 138 lecture. Yeah, but somehow there, there are all kinds of other things in the office that seem kind of interesting to me. And then there's this stupid computer over there and all kinds of surfing that could be done on that. And if somebody said, yes, but what do you think is the best thing to do right now? The answer is obvious. The best thing to do would be to prepare my lecture. So what are you doing? Well, I'm goofing around in front of the television set. Maybe this never happens to you, uh, this sort of event. But I have to say, it does happen to me quite frequently. I go to the party and I say absolutely no more than one glass of wine at the party. Well, the wine tasted pretty good. And they came around with more glasses. And if somebody had said to me, now what's the best thing for you to do right now? I would say the best thing to do would be not to have any more wine. Uh, could I have another glass of the Chardonnay? Thank you. And that happens all the time. And as I remarked the other day, the picture of weakness of will, if somehow or other the guy is in a frenzy of lust. That's not the way it is with me. I, I don't think, i got to have a Chardonnay, and I lunge over and grab the uh, glass off of the tray. No, it's quite elegant. I, I never miss a beat in the elegant conversation I'm having with Lady Frisbee or Sir John. Uh, and, and I simply pick up another glass and begin to sip it as if nothing were happening. Now, I think this is, I, 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 if you find this story incredible, uh, you're very much in comfort with the, with the philosophical tradition. But I think these things happen. Uh, very common. So there's something wrong with this conception of rationality. If it says weakness of will, literally, weakness of will is impossible on the tradition. They say that apparently occurs, but apparent cases of weakness of will are really something else. I'll just I'll take questions a second. I want to go uh, through these because I'm gonna I, I'm gonna refute all of these. Now, um, the whole system works on the assumption that you have a set of primary desires. And you bring these primary desires to the decision-making situation. Rationality will consist in how to satisfy your primary desires. And this often, typically, will cons consist in selecting means to achieve your ends. That's why this type of reasoning is typically called means ends reasoning. You have these ends and you try to satisfy them by forming secondary desires. You had the primary desires, but rationality will enable you to perform secondary desires. So you go into the travel agent Nobody does this anymore. It's all done on the net. But in the old days, you go in the travel agent and you say, I want a plane ticket to Paris. Now, notice they don't look at you and say, what are you, some kind of a ticket fetishist? Uh, what's this big deal about a ticket? I, what, are you, you lusting after tickets? No, uh, they understand. It's a means to an end. You have reason Paris. The best way to go to Paris is to go by plane. If I'm going to go to plane, I have to buy, buy plane. I have to buy a ticket. So I form a secondary desire for the ticket. Somebody says, what are you going to do this afternoon? I say, well, I want to go to my dentist uh, because I, um, I'm due now to have a tooth filled. And the guy says, what? You want to have somebody drilling your teeth? Well, that's not, as they say, an end in itself. That is a means to fulfilling other ends, whereas the primary desires are the ends in themselves. 
uh, where I, I, you drink the beer not because it is a means to some other end. I need to get fat or I need to improve the stock of, uh, 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 of the Budweiser Brewing Company. No, it's an end in itself. I'm not doing that. But when I go to the dentist, that is a means. The secondary desires give you means toward achieving the various ends that you have given by the primary desires. Furthermore, another basic assumption uh, is the whole set of beliefs and desires must be consistent. Uh, because if you had inconsistent primary desires, then it would be impossible to reason. And you all know that an inconsistent proposition entails any proposition whatever, so you'd get a total breakdown. Now, we could add to this list, but it gives you a certain conception of rationality, and I want to say I think it's wrong in every detail, and I'm going to try to offer you another conception of rationality. But first, let's take questions. I, had, so I saw some hands up. Uh, it was somebody who had their hand up, and I said, well, did you have your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. We'll come back to you. Okay, that's the target. Now I want to go through some of these. I've already said a few words about this, but but it, there's an interesting puzzle. When I do something in the full knowledge that I don't think it's the best thing for me to do, uh, how is that possible? How is it possible that I can do something fully cognizant of the fact that that's not the best thing for me to be doing right then and there? Did you have your hand up? No, okay. But you finally got yours up, yeah. halfway. When I do something on the basis of uh, it not being the best thing uh, to do, yes, that's irrational behavior. The problem is, how is it possible, given that actions are caused by beliefs and desires? And I did have uh, the belief and the desire. I had the desire to do the best thing and the belief that this was not the best thing. And yet, I did the thing I thought was not the best thing and did it voluntarily. See, there are cases where the guy is in a grip of an addiction or a lust or a rage, and if he could pause and think, he might think, okay, this, I shouldn't really be doing this. But the, the problem is not that these cases are rational. Of course, they're irrational. The question is, how are they possible at all, given that all actions are caused by beliefs and desires, and that I had the beliefs and the desires? The standard account is to say, well, there was something wrong with your beliefs and desires. That's Davidson's account. Davidson's account is that, and it's Hare's account also, uh, that, that when you acted out of weakness of will, it's because you didn't really have an unconditional desire to do the thing you thought best. You only had a conditional, a sort of second-rate desire to do the thing that you thought best. I'm very confused what best is here. Yeah, best means high, uh, that which you value the most. It, it needn't be, it ca could be moral. Now, Hare makes this a criterion for your moral judgment. The moral principle says, uh, uh, this is R.M. Hare I'm talking about. The moral principle is the one that you will act on given uh, all the other considerations you have. If you acted this way uh, as opposed to that way, then that proves that this was an expression of your moral principle. So the mo moral principle is supposed to be the one that you act on. And irrationality, if actions are caused by beliefs and desires, then if you act irrationally, as uh, weakness of will illustrates, it must be because there's something wrong with the beliefs and the desires. Now, my problem is very simple, and that is I have uh, beliefs and desires all the time. And there's nothing wrong with my beliefs and desires. It's just I don't always act on, the, on what I think is the most desirable thing to do. I often do things that are not the most desirable thing to do, like have another glass of wine at the party. We'll come back to this. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Of course. Mm, so I don't see, I see, as soon as you do all the I mean, I, 
Okay, no, no, I, th this is not the problem. I didn't state the problem clearly, so let me say it again. Granted that you want, uh, uh, granted that you believe that the best thing to do is not to drink the wine, and you want to do the best thing, granted uh, uh, that you do want the wine, uh, you're certainly acting on your desire when you take the wine, but why do you act on that desire when that's not your highest desire? Your highest desire, as you are perfectly willing to admit. I mean, I, I, your spouse points at you, should you really be drinking that wine? Don't you really think it's best not to drink the wine? And, and if you're me, you say quite elegantly, yes, I'm sure you're right. And then you take a glass of wine. This, that's the puzzle. How is it possible that you can act on one desire which you believe to be a lower desire than the other desire which you believe to be the higher desire, the thing you desire most, and yet you don't do it? Uh, I'm sure this never happens to you, but I have had students who definitely wanted to do their paper on time, but somehow or other, they were going to decide they are going to do the paper this very evening, but it got to be midnight, and there they were still in front of the television set having finished a six-pack of beer. Uh, uh, now, that's weakness of will, and I think such things happen. And of course, they're irrational. The question is, how are they possible? if actions are caused by beliefs and desires, and this is a case where you had the highest desire. Now, it's, it, one way to answer it is to say, well, that proves that wasn't really, uh, you didn't really believe that was the best thing to do because you didn't do it. But I don't think that's right. I really did believe it was the best thing to do, but I still didn't do it. Yes? You, you, you slipped in there as fast as you could, and I want to do the best thing to do. Yeah. But I mean, that's just clearly not the case. You, you have these ideas of best and should yeah. that are moral, Okay, so this is one, uh, one answer to the problem of weakness of will is you didn't really value the thing that, uh, that you said you, you valued. But what about the guy who, yeah, he really does value it. As, as um, uh, St. Augustine uh, uh, said, uh, God give me chastity, but not yet. Uh, he really did desire it, but he wanted to stall around for a while. Uh, and maybe that's a, a, a one way to describe the guy at the party. I'll, I'll be more virtuous at the next party, but that's a cop-out. I mean, I think that the, the real problem arises because you definitely have a, 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 a preference schedule, and yet you don't act on it. Now, there's some other forms of irrationality that are related to this I'm going to come to. Yes? Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. The time figures largely in this, but that's, that, let's leave it out of this particular decision making. Because right now, at this particular point, I think I should be doing something else other than this. I should be not drinking the wine, but should be being virtuous right here and now. All the same, I'm drinking the wine. Right here and now, I think I should be preparing my lecture for Philosophy 138. This is an hour or so ago. But all the same, I'm not. I'm doing other things, uh, checking my email or other uh, ways that are uh, ways of stalling around instead of doing the thing I really think I ought, I most think I ought to be doing. Now, you, there is a, a, a conflict that's come up here, and this is uh, important, and that is, what about the conflict of duty and desire? where desire overcomes duty. Now, part of the classical model is you could only act on your duty if you wanted to, because every voluntary action is an expression of a desire to do that action. Okay, now I think that is, again, a profound mistake, but I haven't yet got the resources to tell you. Let me show you some other difficulties with this account. You had your hand up, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Okay, a weakness of will tends to correlate with another famous phenomenon, self-deception. 
Uh, and it's very easy to prove that weakness of will is impossible. Uh, the proof goes as follows. Anything you do uh, voluntarily, you do because you most want to do that thing. But what you most want to do is an expression of what you value then and there. I, I therefore, I, it's impossible for you voluntarily to do something that you don't most value to do then and there. And yet, weakness of will happens. The argument for self-deception goes as, against self-deception goes as follows. In order for A to deceive B, A has to believe something uh, and want to induce in B, uh, the, um, A has to believe that P and want to induce in B the belief that not P. But if A and B are identical, how would it be possible for me ever to deceive myself? Because I would have to produce in myself a belief which I did not believe. So I really believe that we're going to have rain in the month of November, but I will convince myself that we won't have any rain in the month of November. How am I supposed to do that if um, I, I am identical with the guy who holds both the belief and is supposed to be the victim, or supposed to be the recipient of the other belief? The problem is with weakness of will, as with self-deception, happens all the time. Self-deception is very common. How is it possible? I just gave you a proof that both weakness of will and self-deception are impossible, but they both happen. So in our theory of rationality, we've got to explain how they happen. Well, let me mention some other difficulties with this famous account. When I first read this account as an undergraduate, it occurred to me, on this account, if I value 25 cents a quarter, and I value my life, I, it follows that on this account there are some odds at which I would bet my life against a quarter. Some odds uh, at which I'd bet my life against a quarter because precisely uh, rationality consists in estimating the probability of satisfying your desires, giving your beliefs. Now, I have a very high desire for my life and a much lower desire for 25 cents. But if I desire both, if I have some desire for 25 cents, it follows mathematically, according to decision theory. If I'm rational, there must be some odds at which I would bet my life against 25 cents. And I have to tell you, there are no odds at which I would bet my life against 25 cents. Uh, and if there were, I mean, if in a reckless moment, uh, I, I wouldn't bet my child's life against 25 cents. I'm not risking my child at any odds. Now, here's the funny thing. I have argued precisely this point with the most famous decision theorists of the, of the last, of the 20th century, with Isaac Levy uh, and, what's that get, name of that guy in, uh, Jimmy Savage in Ann Arbor. I argued with Isaac in, in, in Columbia and Jimmy Savage, and they're the two best decision theorists, and they sadly came to the conclusion, you're just irrational. <laughs> Now, I have to say, they got a problem about rationality with their theory. If their theory says that if you value your life and you value your 25 cents, there must be some odds at which you would bet your life against 25 cents. Here, let me give you one. I would take questions about this. this. I think this whole subject's a lot of fun. Here's another thing that comes up, and it will come up in the next month, and it's this. It must be irrational uh, to vote. Why? Well. The chances that you will affect the outcome of the election are almost infinitesimally small. Let's take a presidential election, where there, you know there are going to be 50 million people voting, at least for the winner. Uh, and the chances that your vote are going to affect the outcome are infinitesimally small. In California, they're worse than infinitesimally small because the preponderance of Democratic registered voters is so overwhelming. I, I, that I, it's very hard to imagine a circumstance in which you would cast the deciding vote, even for the California electoral vote. So, but there's some disutility in voting. There's some cost to voting. You have to go in the poll booth and you got to stand in line and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but if that's the case, then it's always irrational to vote in an election. Uh, and there are the, always these famous anecdotes about the two famous economists 
who run into each other standing in line at the poll booth and they say, well, my wife made me come or something like that, or my spouse insists it's my civic duty. But, but just as a piece of rationality, it's irrational of you to vote uh, uh, because, well, it, 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 there's a cost and no real probability of a payoff. You pay for something with your time and effort, but the chances that it's actually going to make a difference are much less than the chances you would have betting on the lottery. Now, some people have said, well, uh, there is, it, it's kind of rational to vote because it's like a lottery. There is an infinitesimally small chance that you will affect the outcome, but uh, there's some chance they're going to count your vote. So it's not totally irrational to vote, but you have a feeling that these guys are embarrassed to say that. Now, I think this, they have an extremely impoverished conception of rationality. If, I, I would want to say, in fact, the following. If you get the result that it's irrational in a democratic society to vote, th then you know you made a mistake. And one of the answers they have to me when I've debated these guys is to say, yeah, but you might think it's your civic duty. It's part of your duty as, assistant, as a citizen. Since when is a citizen under a duty to behave irrationally? After all, we've just established that voting is irrational. So how can I have a civic duty to do something which is mathematically irrational? I have no civic duty to add 2 plus 2 and get 5. And that would be like my uh, a civic duty to vote if, in, if it's just plainly irrational. Uh, OK, I think these are real difficulties with the classical model. Uh, that it has the effect that uh, there must be some odds at which I would bet my life against 25 cents. I, I, and I, the in ingenuity that these guys have in meeting that argument, I'll tell you about them later. Um, uh, they say, well, you drive to San Francisco airport, don't you? Right, OK. You're risking your life driving to San Francisco airport. Yeah, in some sense. I, if I crawled out, get in bed and crawled on the covers, the chances of being killed are less than they are on the freeway. OK, now divide your trip to San Francisco airport into 25 cent units. <laughs> OK, now each time you pass one of those units, you're betting your life against 25 cents. Everybody see how the argument goes? Uh, OK, I, that tell, then they have a more, they not only have a nutty conception of rationality, they have a nutty conception of the mind and intentionality. But we'll get to that later. I'll consider this argument in more detail. You had your hand up at the back. Yeah. OK, here's how it goes. Uh, uh, let me tell you the argument in some detail. Suppose I offered you $1,000 to drive to San Francisco airport. Would you take it? Yeah, I could always use the extra 1000 bucks. I just paid my taxes, and I could use it more than ever. Uh, OK, now here's how the argument goes. But now the $1,000 that you're going to get when you get to San Francisco airport can be divided into 25 cent units, right? It's a finite, a finite division. And there will be some point on the freeway where you pass this part of the freeway and only made 25 cents. But by your own admission, in passing that part of the freeway, you're, in, you're risking your life. So you were betting your life against 25 cents. Ha, we refuted Searle, OK? Uh, I don't think that's a good argument. But you have to understand something about intentionality to see why it's not a good argument. I'll come back to that later. Uh, right now, I'm trying to lay out what some of the issues are. OK, let's go through these and see how far we get. I was going to get through all of these. And I'm not going to make it, but I'll get through a bunch of them. OK, to begin with, it is not the case that actions where rational are caused by beliefs and desires. Where, if we're talking about causation as giving causally sufficient conditions, then the actions that are caused by beliefs and desires are those that are compulsive, typically irrational. Action. That's the guy who has an overwhelming desire to satisfy his urge to take heroin. And he has a belief that the stuff in front of him is heroin. So he is in the grip of his belief and desire. And his action is ca genuinely caused by beliefs and desires. But it's not rational. In fact, I, I've said this before, and I want to emphasize it now. As far as our phenomenology is concerned, as far as our experience is concerned, in normal rational action, you have a sense of alternative possibilities open. In the last election, 
Uh, I had a choice between two candidates, and though I voted for one, uh, I considered the possibility of voting for the other, and it was a genuine possibility. It, it, given the causes operating on me, I voted for one candidate, but I could have voted for the other guy. So as far as my decision making is concerned, as we've seen already, the beliefs and the desires lead to a prior intention, and the prior intention leads to an intention in action, and there's a gap. There is a perceived gap between the reasons for the action and the decision. So far from it being a model of rationality, the cases where my beliefs and my desires are causally sufficient to fix my action are typically irrational or compulsive forms of behavior. In rational action, I have a sense of alternative possibilities open, and that, as I pointed out to you, that gap has a name. That's the so-called freedom of the will. Now, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe my actions are entirely caused my beliefs and desires, but that's not part of the definition of rationality. On the contrary, that is opposed to rationality because those would be compulsive actions. So when I make up my mind rationally, which of these candidates am I going to vote for, I do it on the presupposition that my antecedently existing beliefs and desires are not causally sufficient. I have to bridge the gap by making up my mind. As they say, I have to decide what to do. And there's a very peculiar locution in English that's going to figure large in our discussion, and that is I act on a reason. I had different reasons for voting uh, for McCain and different reasons for voting for Obama, but I made a specific reason or reasons effective by acting on that reason. Now, what does that mean? I acted on a reason. I, and I, well, I'm going to uh, say more about that when we talk about rational decision making. But the important thing is to see that characteristically, in rational decision making, I do not sense my antecedent beliefs and desires as setting causally sufficient conditions. Now, there is a problem that comes up, and I haven't addressed that, but I'm gonna, I've mentioned it in passing, and that is that typically in uh, hard decision-making situations, some of my reasons are desire-independent. I have reasons for doing something, even though I may not then and there feel a desire or an inclination to do it. And, it, and I have a, an apparent paradox I need to resolve. The paradox is this. All voluntary intentional actions are expressions of a desire to do that action then and there. And that's true even for, for uh, actions that are apparently motivated by desire independent reasons. Yes, all the same. I wanted to do that in order to keep my promise. And right then and there, I wanted to keep my promise. But if keeping my promise is a desire independent reason, and I act on that reason, then how can it be the case that my action is the expression of a desire to perform that action if the reason for the action was a desire independent reason? And that's an apparent contradiction in my account, and I have to resolve that. I haven't resolved it yet, but I'm going to resolve it. And I think it's very important about human rationality to see exactly how it can be the case that desire independent reasons can motivate desires, even though the motivation for the desire was not another desire. One of the problems with this whole classical model that I'm describing here is it assumes that you have an inventory of prior desires before you approach the decision-making situation. That is false to human phenomenology. I ask the person in a restaurant, what do you want? What would you like? And she says, I don't know. Now, how can, I, I, yeah, the Cartesian in all of us says, how can you not know what your own desires are? Everybody must know what their own desires are. But that is a common answer to the question of, what would you like? What do you want? I don't know. I, I haven't made up my mind. And guess what? Making up your mind is the name of rational decision making. In other words, the assumption that you come to the decision-making situation with an inventory of desires 
and then just decide how to satisfy your desires given your beliefs. That's a very artificial conception. Normally in the decision-making situation, you got to figure out what your desires are. You get a last question, then we'll stop. Yes. Yes, but the problem is here the pleasure is not separable from the choice of what I eat. So I'm trying, to, and the way it actually works with me in a restaurant is I try to visualize: Do I really want a plate full of shrimp, or do I want a plate full of steak? Uh, and then I try to visualize both. Now it's, it's okay to say yes, but they're both pleasurable dining experiences. Which is more pleasurable? And by the way, I don't know why all restaurants don't adopt the Japanese method where you get a photograph of the damn thing that you're supposed to eat. <laughs> Anyway, I'll, I'll bring photographs next time. We'll go on with this on Thursday. Now, we're into the a second main topic of the course, and that is the nature of rationality. And there is a, a standard conception of rationality. It's in decision theory. It's uh, in any economics textbook. Probably the best um, uh, statement of it is in that article assigned in the reader by Gary Becker, and what's it called, the Economic Approach to Behavior or something like that. And uh, there it is, a classical statement of uh, uh, rationality. And I told you some difficulties with that, just prima facie difficulties. Uh, one is that if I value 25 cents and I value my life, there must be some odds at which I'd bet my life against 25 cents. And I want to say there aren't any uh, odds at which I'd make that bet. If there were, I wouldn't bet my child's life against 25 cents. And the answer that we mentioned, somebody mentioned last time to that that's given to me is, well, uh, you'll do things that are equivalent to that and whenever you drive to the airport or pick up 25 cents off the street. Now, I want to show that's a bad argument, but uh, to do that, we have to say more about intentionality. So we'll come to that. Another difficulty with a classical analysis is that on the classical analysis, it's irrational uh, to vote. Uh, for reasons that I said uh, the other day. But there are other things that are absurd consequences of the classical analysis. Here's another one. Um, <clears throat> I go to the San Francisco Opera. Uh, it often happens uh, that on the day of the opera, I think, oh, God, I don't want to drive all the way to San Francisco. And then I think, how much I paid for the ticket? God, well, and then that gives me an extra reason for going. Now, on the classical model of rationality, that's no reason for going to the opera at all. Uh, those are what's called sunk costs. So on the classical analysis, uh, there are two different scenarios. One is when you're given a free ticket, and on the day of uh, going, you just don't feel like going, so you don't use the free ticket. Another, same opera, same ticket, only this time you pay $300 for the ticket, and you think, well, that's a lot of money. I better go. Now, on the classical analysis, you're being irrational. You have exactly the same reason for going with a free ticket as you do with the expensive ticket. I think that's another absurd result, and I need to say why that's an absurd uh, result. Uh, I mean, D Bob Nozick, I, I put it very well, he said, suppose you could take a pill that prevented this form of irrationality, that prevented you from reasoning about the, uh, how you should consider money you've already spent in making your decisions, and would you take the pill? And the answer is no, I wouldn't take the pill. I think there's nothing wrong with reasoning. But the technical name for that is, well, that's a sunk cost. You've already spent that money. Um, uh, Becker is a guy who thinks when you get married, essentially calculate utilities. Don't ask yourself such dumb questions as, do you love this person? Uh, because who the hell knows what the marginal utility of that is? The thing to do is calculate utilities. I've often wondered what uh, those guys would say about rationality in a country like Mexico. I think the rational thing to do is accept bribes. Uh, and I don't see how they could avoid that argument. And indeed, accept bribes anywhere if you have good reason to suppose you can get away with it. It's just calculating probabilities like any other. Okay, we're going to come back uh, to that. But now I'm going step by step through uh, the six propositions that I figured were essential to uh, the uh, classical model. And the first was that actions are caused by beliefs and desires. That is, rational actions, where rational, are caused, and sometimes they say, in the right way. They're caused in the right way by the beliefs and desires. Now, I want to say, if 
causation here means causally sufficient conditions, then in general only irrational actions have beliefs and desires as causally sufficient conditions. Those are the case where you're in the grip of an obsession or you're in the grip of a lust and you simply can't help yourself. Those are the cases where your action is caused by your beliefs and desires, but they're hardly compulsive behavior is hardly the model of rationality. It happens to us, but it's not what I would think of as the right way to think of rationality. Well, what's wrong with it? Well, in real life, you have this experience that I call the experience of uh, the gap. Uh, you have a sense of possible options open to you. And the name for that gap, to repeat, is freedom of the will. Now, the fact that you have these experiences don't show that you really have free will. The whole thing might be a colossal illusion. Evolution might have played an enormous practical joke on us by giving us the conviction, the experience of free will, when it's all an illusion, all of our behavior is completely determined. It was written in the book of history 13 billion years ago that at this particular moment, in this particular um, spot, Searle's left hand would go out and scratch the top of his remaining head. Uh, oh, oh, okay, now uh, that's the picture. It's it. Uh, it's an elegant picture, and and indeed a lot of philosophers have thought, well, you can't help that picture. You couldn't think without that picture. Kant said we couldn't reason about reality unless we presupposed total determinism. Now he also cheated on the side, as is typical. He said, of course, there's another world, the world of the noumenal. And in that world, you're free. Okay. But it's in this world where I live. I've never been to Noumenal. You know, I, I think it must be somewhere in Kansas. But in, 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 on the West Coast, it's all phenomenal. And on the phenomenal world, according to Kant, everything is determined. And indeed, if it wasn't determined, we wouldn't be able, wouldn't be able to make sense of it. It would be unintelligible to us. Now, you might think, well, that's an extreme view, but something very like it is advanced by philosophers uh, that we all know and respect. And I'm thinking of Tom Nagel and Galen Strawson, and they argue as follows. Suppose determinism wasn't true. Suppose you really did have free will. Then if you're asked, why did you do something, and you gave a non-determinist answer, you wouldn't explain it. You say, somebody said, why did you vote for Obama? Uh, and you give your reasons for voting for Obama. Now, suppose determinism wasn't true, then says Nagel. The explanation of the action would not explain the action, because an explanation has to explain why the thing that occurred occurred as opposed to something else that might have occurred. But if the explanation you give is non-deterministic, then it's consistent with all sorts of other things occurring. You might have voted for the other guy. You might not have voted for all so you would not have succeeded in explaining anything. Does everybody follow this? That is, unless the story goes, and this is advanced both by Strawson, that's Galen, uh, Peter, uh, by Strawson and by Tom Nagel, unless the explanation of human behavior is deterministic, it wouldn't explain. It would not answer the question we're trying to answer, namely, why did you do it? Okay, I, my, I resist the temptation to answer all of these uh, points right now, but, I, but these are uh, promises that I'm making to you. We have to answer uh, these points. We have to answer the claim that says that an explanation, a non-deterministic explanation would simply fail to explain because it would, an explanation has to say why the thing that happened happened as opposed to something else that could have happened. And if it doesn't answer that question, then it doesn't explain. Jennifer. Well, the story in uh, Nagel, and I think in, in Strawson as well, is, goes as follows. What do you want from an explanation? Suppose I, I knock uh, this hat and it falls uh, to the ground. And the explanation, I want an explanation of why it fell to the ground. I say, it was acted on by the force of gravity and there were no other interfering forces. That being the case, it had to fall to the ground. The explanation gives sufficient conditions. Given that setup, 
Nothing else could have happened. It had to fall to the ground. But now, when I explain why I voted for Obama, then it looks like, unless determinism is true, I don't satisfy that condition. Because at the end of the story, somebody says, well, okay, you thought he'd be better uh, uh, for the economy, and you thought it wouldn't matter for foreign policy. Uh, the Republicans and the Democrats were going to have effectively the same foreign policy. Obama might do it with better public relations, which is what, in fact, happened. Uh, but the policy in Iraq and Afghanistan is pretty much identical under both Obama uh, and Bush and would have been the same under McCain. So it has to be uh, something uh, domestic. And if somebody then says to me, okay, that's why you voted for Obama, but you mean given all that you had to vote for him? No, I could have voted for the other guy. In fact, there were moments when I thought, God, if all these politically correct people think Obama's okay, there must be something terribly wrong with him that I'm not seeing, you know. Uh, uh, but in any case, uh, I give an explanation. And according to Nagel and other philosophers whom I respect, uh, like Galen Strawson, if the explanation wasn't deterministic, it wouldn't explain. It wouldn't explain why I did what I did as opposed to something else I might have done. It's not enough to say, well, there was this reason in favor of doing it. You've got to give an explanation that says, this is what had to happen. This is, uh, uh, given the way things were set up, just like this, this is what had to happen. Now, why do we know that Nagel's wrong? We know that he's wrong because in our own case, I know why I did something. I know, I know that the explanation, I know without observation, that the explanation is valid. I know that's the reason I acted on. Of course, it might be self-deception or all kinds of other cases, but leaving them out, leaving aside uh, various forms of uh, 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 psychological aberrations, I, I know why I did what I did, even though the answer that I give to the question, why did you do it, is not a deterministic answer. Now, how can that be the case? How can it be the case? that I can give reasons for action, which are valid reasons, and they're not deterministic. And if somebody said, well, how do you know they're valid? And the answer is, they're valid for me. I can tell you what, I, what reason, how my reasoning process went and what reason I acted on. Now, of course, uh, there's always self-deception, uh, pathologies of various kind, uh, uh, the various kinds of psychotic behavior, but we're leaving them out. We're assuming this is not a case for a psychoanalyst. It's a case for a philosopher analyzing uh, uh, rational decision making. Okay, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm going to come back to these issues later. Other questions at this point? Because we're, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, another story goes as follows. We ought to think of decision making as like a vector of forces in a matrix. And I don't know if you ever had to do these uh, questions in high school physics. I did, where you got a force operating that way and another force operating this way, and this force a bit stronger than that force, so you wind up. Uh, going that way or something like that. Uh, why isn't it like that? Well, the answer is it isn't like that. There's no way I can vote for a guy in the middle, right? If this one over here is Obama and this is McCain, I can't think, well, I got these forces working that way and that forth that way, so I'll calculate and, and vote for this guy in the middle. There was no guy in the middle. You have to, uh, you have, well, there may have been other third party candidates, but I don't remember even who they were. They, I didn't take them seriously at the time. Um, I, I, but you're right, though, that all of these things, on the account that I've been giving you, exist within a network and exist against the background of possibilities. I, and it's only given the network and the background that I can make rational decisions at all, that I can have any intentionality. Yes? Yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, I think you're right there that you have all these influences operating on you. But here's what's remarkable. I want you to always pay close attention to how we describe these things in ordinary language. I had various reasons for voting for Obama, 
various reasons for voting for the other guy, various readings voting for and against, but all the same, this is why I voted the way I did. Now watch this. I made this reason effective. There are all these other reasons, but they weren't effective. I made this reason effective by acting on this reason. Uh, there was a guy who was the president of the United States once, and I voted for him when he got elected. Uh, but then he came up another time, and it turned out he had done something in college. He went to the same university I did, and he did something that I regard as absolutely outrageous uh, when he was a Rhodes Scholar in Oxford, un absolutely unforgivable. So I did not vote against Bill Clinton the second time around. Why? He didn't take his exams. You have to take the damn exams. Now, I admit, I'm probably the only guy in the whole country that voted against Clinton on the grounds that he never took schools. The rest of us dressed up in these dumb outfits. You, you look like a penguin. Uh, you, uh, the girls have to wear all black so we will not be distracted. Uh, even their uh, stockings have to be black. The guys dress in dark suits with a white bow tie and a black gown, and everybody sits at a separate desk that's got your name printed on it, for God's sake. It's this whole thing is scary, and you have to take the exam. Clinton didn't do it. He had his money. He'd, met, he'd done what he wanted to do in Oxford, which was make a, a lot of connections, which he later used. Well, forget it. That's as far, when I found out he didn't take his exams, that was it. I had a, and I, I, don't tell me, well, maybe that's not the real reason you voted against Clinton. That was the reason I acted on. Did I think he was otherwise a better candidate? Probably so, but I didn't give a damn. You don't take schools, you don't get my vote. Yes. Yeah, often you don't know why you did it, uh, you just did it. And often, um, you see, it often happens to me that in conversations I say things I never planned on saying. I didn't, right. I mean, people who do this you always think, now he said this, so I'm going to say that. There's a technical name for them, they're called bores. As a term. I mean, it's very boring for the guy who always thinks, what should I say now? And most of us just talk spontaneously. Uh, but there are forms of rational behavior that are involve what I call recognitional rationality, where you don't have to do a whole lot of reasons from your various desires. The truck is coming down on me, bearing down on me, and I don't think, now, if I get out of the way, I will avoid being hit, and if I don't get out of the way, I'll be hit. And on balance, it's better to avoid being hit because if I do get hit, there'll be all kinds of consequences. You know, I don't do that. I just jump out of the way. That's what I call recognitional rationality. And that's important because that avoids an infinite regress. Uh, well, we'll get to those when we talk about the actual structure of rationality. So there are all kinds of things you do that are not the result of processes of deliberation. And then there are, as we've seen, things you do that are not the result of processes of rational deliberation, where you really do act on your beliefs and desires, but those are pathological. Those are cases of uh, weakness of will or compulsion. Uh, and sometimes you deliberate and make up your mind, and then you don't do the thing you thought was the best thing to do. That's the example of drinking the extra Chardonnay. Uh, from last time. Remember I gave that example how you decide you don't want to drink too much, but all the same you find you do drink more than you should. Now, standard models of decision-making rationality make that impossible. I want to say not only is it possible, it happens all the time. So we ought to have a conception of rationality that shows how it's possible. And I, I, I forget about the philosophical tradition and ask yourself, what actually happened when I I uh, watched television long after I thought I should be watching television when I really thought I should be doing my homework. And I think we, as philosophers, we ought to be able to answer that question without looking over our shoulder at what Aristotle would have said. Just think about what it's like in your own case. And so I want to answer that as well. Uh, okay, well, some of these questions I might answer right now. Uh, in the case of how is it possible that an explanation can explain if it does not give a deterministic explanation, uh, I think the logical form is different. The form, the actual logical form of the explanation is different. The form of the explanation where I say this object fell because it was acted on by gravity, that explanation is deterministic in the very form of the explanation. 
because what it says is that the causes operating on it were sufficient to determine that it would fall. And indeed, the force of the logical sufficiency there is given by the fact that you'd act you can actually logically deduce that it's going to fall, given a description of the initial conditions, together with a statement of the, of the law of gravity, together with a statement of the gravitational forces acting on it. Uh, and that is, the claim of sufficiency is cashed out by saying that a full statement of the causes will be sufficient to entail, they will logically imply that that event was going to occur. So you get a logically sufficient, you get a causally set of sufficient conditions because the statement of the conditions will give you a set of premises which are logically sufficient to entail that the event is going to happen. This you can actually derive that this is going to happen. Now, a lot of people have said, yes, but that's not an oddball case. That's the model for all explanations. And as I mentioned to you briefly, this is the deductive nomological model of explanation. You describe the initial conditions, you give a statement of the law, and you deduce. And it's called deductive nomological because you can actually deduce what's going to happen. And it's nomological. Nomological just means law-like. You can deduce from the statement of the law, together with the, uh, the uh, description of the initial conditions, that deduction will entail that that event is going to happen. Now, that doesn't happen when we give ordinary descriptions of human behavior. I voted for Clinton. Uh, I, I voted uh, for um, Obama because I thought he'd have a better domestic policy than McCain. It isn't like that. It's a different logical form. Well, then, how do we answer the skepticism that says, unless it's like that, you didn't really explain it? You didn't explain it because you didn't say why you had to vote for Obama, why that occurred as opposed to something else occurring that might have occurred. And I'm now going to give you the answer to that question. There must be an answer to it, because I know in my own case that that explains my behavior. I know that's why I did it. And if somebody comes in a deductive nomological way and they say, look, Searle, we've done a study. And it turns out that middle class university professors of your socioeconomic status with your education are overwhelmingly likely to vote for the Democratic candidate in an election like that. We have a law with nearly 100% uh, a probability that that's how you're going to vote. So we can deduce. It's a deductive nomological explanation. So that's why you uh, voted for uh, Obama, because you instantiate uh, the middle class professor law of voting behavior. And I want to say, well, there may be such a law, but that's not why I voted. That's not why I voted the way I did. The statistics you have about people with uh, my kind of background <laughs> and my sort of education, and my sort of economic, uh, socioeconomic status, and my, and my income tax bracket, all the factors you want, that doesn't give you the reason that I voted. That gives you correlations, and they, they might be kind of interesting. But the actual reason that functioned in my voting was not the fact I, I, that I tend to wear um, uh, dark gray flannel trousers and that the overwhelming majority of people who wear pants like that vote Democratic. Let's suppose there is such a generalization. That's not why I voted. It doesn't matter what pants I had on. They could be red polka dots. All the same, I can tell you the reason that I voted for Ob Obama. And this is not the right model. What is the right model? Well, it's an intentionalistic explanation. But now we have to meet the challenge. The challenge is, how can I explain if it's not deductive nomological, if it doesn't explain why what had to occur.